Okay, so I reckon just explain to me, talk about like, your name, what you run, who you are, what you do. Who I am, what I do. Okay, well, look, I'll probably be able to remember that bit. <laughs> Don't forget, I'm old, I might forget some stuff. Uh, Trevor Coombs, um, our business is Fish Fanatics, and we've been here in, uh, in Australia for about 15 years now, and Fish Fanatics was also over in South Africa for another 10 or so. So between the two countries, it's been rolling for quite some time. Now it's all about, uh, in particular, different types of catfish, which I love the most. Anything that's really ugly, uh, fish-wise, I really, really enjoy them. Okay, Nick, here we go. Yes, this is the container, and uh, let's try my caveman approach to opening it. It's a whole lot easier on your back, especially when you're my age. So, come on in. So, right now we're in the... Now we're in the container, and this is where I do a fair amount of um, breeding of Corydoras. And um, the nice thing about this is it's a bought insulated container and uh, you just hardly need any heat here to make it happen, very little, so the costs are, are negligible and you can maintain temp at any time. It's got its own uh, timer system on the lights, so day and night is already set for everybody. I usually have it pretty, pretty dark-ish and that goes well with most of these fish that are nocturnal and um, it, it works well for their breeding. The, the moment you uh, decrease the light for a lot of these fish, they work a whole lot better. Where does fish start out for you? Oh dear. If we go way back, probably when I was uh, about 15 or 16 and I had a few fish uh, in my flat. I had goldfish that I used to breed in my flat and I'd go uh, to have a, a few spawns that I'd get. I kept the uh, goldfish in my bedroom, so whenever they spawned, I was woken up, because I, I, sometimes it was really early in the morning when the first light came along, and I'd get woken up and get splashed by the goldfish, and then I knew, oh well, here they go. <laughs> They're off in, again, so uh, it was then, and um, you know, I'd, I'd grow those out on, to, on the veranda. That's how crazy I was about fish. There were just fish everywhere. But I have various things in here that the corries in particular will spawn on. I'll take this one out because currently this tank's not being used. But this is just such a common garden thing that I use all over the place. It's the base of a filter. It's rubbish bags that are cut up and turned into little, little bits. I tie them to the base of the filter and that can either hang over the tank where the corries will spawn onto it it can hang in the tank where I'll attach it to the top of the tank and then some of the corries will spawn on the base of the filter and sometimes I just have it in a tank to make uh, fish feel at ease. So anytime that fish are being moved from one tank to the next and they're unfamiliar with their surroundings, they'll get a bunch of that that makes them feel at ease. Yeah. And um, all the water runs into a sump where it's filtered. It all runs into a sump. We can have a squizzy at that in a sec. So this is the, the sump neck. It's, um, it's an adapted tank. It's got various levels to it. And uh, it's, it's pretty standard as far as uh, filters are concerned. Uh, in my case, I use a lot of scoria. So there are three different levels of scoria here with a little bit of coral as well. And scoria is just volcanic rock? Scoria is volcanic rock, so it gives you a really good surface area. So uh, you can produce a lot of bacteria in, uh, in scoria. Uh, it's probably one of the cheapest forms of, uh, of filter media that you can use. And, uh, and it works really well. There's also the old bio balls in the back here. Um, and uh, although they don't tumble around, as you'll see in a lot of filters, they're, they're still there and they're still doing their job. And in here you're also so you're feeding live blackworm? I'm feeding live blackworm, so whatever facility we go to, um, there is blackworm that gets fed to the breeders. Um, I, I write things on tanks, so if ever you see on a tank BW, that means those fish have to get fed blackworm. Uh, if there's A on the tank with a, a ring around it, those fish are small enough that they need to be fed Artemia. 
And then there's various other markings on the tank, which is various kinds of dry foods and sizes of dry foods that get fed. We probably have about 12 different types of foods that get fed all the time. Yep. Wow. All right, so I reckon that wraps it up for in here. This is yep. really cool. You nice. want to show us? Yes, let's go and have a look at another system. Uh, I worked for a company called Bayfish uh, for a short time and then uh, decided, you know, I really need to make my own way. Now I used to have my own business in, in South Africa. Um, so let's resurrect Fish Fanatics again. And that's where it all began in a very small home with a tiny backyard. And once again, I started putting up some tunnels and using IBCs as ponds and uh, started producing my own fish and immediately fell back to my love of catfish. Okay, so Nick, this is, the, uh, this is what I call the cold room and it's just based on having no heating anywhere. It's just whatever the room temperature and the outside temperature is. Generally, the tanks will be about 25 degrees at the moment. And in winter, it comes down to about 15 or 16. So the fish change all the time in here, just depending on, on what the season is and what we're doing at the time. So you'll see a lot of fish in here that can deal with the cold. Uh, in particular, we have a lot of busmani that we're growing through right now because the market really needs it. We've got uh, standard curries like pepper curries, albino curries, I bronze believe, curries. I cannot believe how many there are. <laughs> There's a lot, but usually it would be uh, probably three quarters of it would go out to the uh, importers, you know, who would be ordering three, four, five hundred of a color at a time. And obviously that's incredibly cheap. But for us, it's also bread and butter. It's a great turnover. And uh, you can never go wrong with having too many of something that people want to buy three or 400 of. Because it takes a long time to get to where you want to be. Um, you have to be dogmatic. You have to be an incredibly hard worker. You have to uh, just love it, otherwise don't ever get into it. And don't expect to be rich overnight because you never will be. Okay, so we're off to uh, the farm now where all of the fish get stocked. And uh, anything that's ready to go, usually around about a month to six weeks, it will come down here into IBCs. Oh, well, you pick, where would you like to be? We got a... Tun wow. A tunnel that produces corridors in rubbish bins. That's really schmicko, isn't it? We've got a tunnel that's got uh, a few rainbows in it. We've got a kind of a general tunnel there. We've got one that's got a lot of cichlids in it. Let's have a look at the corrie production room. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if it's a wowie because it's not really a tank. It's not really a beautiful looking thing. A bit ordinary, but it works really, really well. So, rubbish bins, uh, cheap as, um, different quarries in virtually every one. Aeration, which quarries always require when they are going to spawn, they want a lot of turnover of water. And I have a uh, plastic tube in every container, and uh, they get fed lots and lots of blackworm as well to make sure that the females are full of eggs. And then every afternoon we come along and we check the tubes, we take out wherever the spawns have been, take them back up to the top farm and hatch them out there. Well, this is definitely one of a kind. <laughs> and um... A lot of what you see with me, I'm afraid, is one of a kind because a lot of it comes from real old-timer kind of uh, production. Uh, of fish, you know, there's a lot of it is what we used to call Heath Robinson in South Africa. It's just held together sometimes with bubble gum and string, but it works. There we go. I wish I knew, I, I really haven't 
added them all up because they're in uh, in a couple of different facilities. So um, at a guess, maybe 500 glass tanks, perhaps, and about 300 IBCs. So Nick, we'll uh, start off with probably the simplest of uh, what's here, and that's the angels. And um, you saw back there, there, were, uh, there was a pair of angels producing on a pole. And once the spawn is done, I'll bring it across to uh, the warmed area here, and we'll put the entire pole into a tank. And uh, for the next week, it will be there uh, in methylene blue, just to stop fungusing coming up. Uh, some people use shrimps for the same purpose. I prefer methylene blue. But uh, after about a week after, be, after they've been produced, they'll be hatched and looking for their first feed of Artemia. Viability-wise, when I first started off and you just have a few tanks and a few ponds, it's a struggle always. You know, you just have to keep on building. And, and I'm the sort of guy that everything that I use, I make myself. So. I make, as you can see, they're rough and ready, but I make all the stands, I make all of the tanks, everything that you'll be seeing, wherever it is, I've made it myself. Uh, so that takes a little while to put together. There's never been the money to, uh, to buy and just put in a hundred tanks just like that. I've never been in that position up until recently. Eventually you get to the stage where suddenly it's just a whole lot easier. You've got enough to draw from, there's always fish stock, there's always stuff to sell, and suddenly it's a whole lot easier, but it is one hell of a lot of work to get there, yeah. So Nick, this is the uh, last room that we have, and uh, this is an addition to the business that came along about five years ago. We decided that we'd take over a business from a guy who no longer was interested. And it kind of went hand in hand with the whole fish game. So these are ceramics that are made specifically for uh, particular fish in tanks. So we make uh, bristlenose breeding logs, uh, we make uh, sort of cichlid caves. We'll make smaller caves for particular kinds of Tanganyikan cichlids that like to uh, breed in a, a sort of a vertical crevice kind of thing. There's just probably 20, 25 different types of cave that we do now and uh, it's going to keep on expanding. <laughs> and, um, and so your partner actually makes all of these ceramics? Anna makes Almost all of it now, I'm just uh, kind of tied up with the fish so much that uh, I really uh, come along and give a helping hand. And you can see here all the little details that she's really perfected here on yeah, the, yeah. the caves and that. I mean, if you, if you take some of these where, you know, she's put knots into them and little bulges that look like the kind of uh, humps that you get on trees and things, she, she's turned them into a kind of a log, a kind of a tree stump. And that's, that's the thing that we aim for. We hate for all this plastic stuff that is just everything looks exactly the same. We try and make our ceramics very different or as different, different as we possibly can. And natural. Yeah, and beautiful. natural. And natural, yeah. All right, well, I think that's probably mm. wraps up the whole entire business. So I really appreciate you taking us through. It's a pleasure. And um, I hope people really enjoy it. I'm sure they will. Uh, and uh, thank you guys for coming. It's been so nice to see you. Awesome. Good one.